So before we dive into this, I, I want to share with you uh, a couple things. Uh, one, uh, last couple weeks we've been talking a little bit about blankets and backpacks, the uh, ministry that we're doing to uh, just help and, and reach out to some of the homeless uh, here in Corpus Christi. Uh, and we've had some fantastic, amazing reports just of being able to get people off the streets and into shelters and begin to help them. Uh, this was really cool, though. Today... We showed up to the building, and there are two boxes of, I don't know how many backpacks are in here, that are just ready, along with this anonymous note that we received. And it simply says, and I don't read you all the anonymous notes we received, because most of them are not this nice. Um, but when you get a good one, you're excited. And so and it says this, Dear Fellowship of Oslo Creek, we've been blessed by your online services and touched for the loving heart of your church. We hope these backpacks will help you in your endeavors to bless the less fortunate. Jesus tells us you will recognize them by their fruit. The fellowship of Ozo Creek is bearing good fruit. God's abundant blessings over you all. Um, I wanted to share that with you guys this morning. Simply uh, that the light that is shining is letting people know that Jesus is Lord. Uh, that what is happening here, what God is doing here, people are excited to get on board with. One of the, the amazing things, and I was talking with uh, Don and Mindy, and the whole blankets and backpack thing came out of their imaginations and their hearts for this. Um, and I said, one of the ways that you know God is in something is where you're not doing it. God is just moving, and you're like, all right, I'm being pushed in this direction. And you can just see it, and you can't fight it because uh, his manifestation is so real. And we're so excited to be able to share not only this with you guys, but I'm really excited next week uh, we're going to share with you some exciting things that are happening overseas and in Ecuador. Uh, make sure you're here for that, and do not miss out on those things as well. Um, we're excited to share with you guys what's happening at Agape Ranch, and all of this is happening because of not only your gifts, not only your giving, but your work, your heart, and your light that is shining before the people. And I love that people are saying, seeing the fruit. They're seeing your light that you are bearing. So thank you so much for that. If you would open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. We're, we're here. We're finally into the Sermon of the, on the Mount. I set out to say, man, let's, let's go through the Sermon on the Mount and spend some time there. And, and I knew it was going to take some buildup. I knew it was going to take some introduction. I knew it was going to take some time to get there. And so last week we talked about how we are in the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is coming to us. Not that heaven's a place that we go when we die, but Jesus has actually came to earth, and now his kingdom here is expanding, and we're beginning in this whole series about the Sermon on the Mount to talk about what does it look like to live as citizens of the kingdom? What does it look like to live as members of God's family? And we're calling the series, This is the Way, because this is the way we live when we live into Jesus. And immediately... Jesus is going to flip everything we expect upside down on its head. To say everything that you've come to expect, everything that the world teaches you, is not the way that I'm going to do this. And he'll spend these first 12 verses just completely trying to reorient us into his kingdom. Sarah read this morning, Jesus' welcome, as it were, as he gets into this Sermon on the Mount. It's what we call the Beatitudes. This word beatitude is simply the Latin word for blessing. Uh, we change the rest of the Bible from, you know, Latin into English, you know, or from uh, Greek into English as our translations got better, uh, except for this word. We decided to leave the word beatitude in Latin for some strange reason. But this is Jesus' blessings. It's how he chooses to open this message, and he simply begins with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure at heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom. Kingdom of God. And then he expands upon this idea and said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil stuff about you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because that's the way that they treated the prophets who came before you. And so immediately we think, I I'm not sure I like Jesus' blessings. Like, I'm not sure this is the blessings that I want in my life. I'm not sure how I feel about who he says is truly blessed. 
This word blessed in your Bible, we wrote it down in your Greek notes this way. It's the Greek word makarios. Makarios. Say that with me. Makarios. Makarios to you too. Um, this word makarios can mean blessing, but it's not, the kind of, it's not the word for blessing that we use in either the Hebrew or the Greek for the blessing of God. It's not the kind of blessing that God blessed Abraham and then Abraham blessed Isaac. This word is more like when you walk by somebody on the street and you greet them with the word blessing. You know, like, hey, it's another word, another translation of this word is the word happy. It's simply to say, hey, happy are those who are sad. And now you've lost me, Jesus. Because that means the exact opposite. But that's what he said. Blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who are sad. And I'm like, no, sad, sad people are sad. Like, why are they happy? And another way to say it would be this word congratulations, like good on you. I'm happy for you, Makarios. It can even be said sarcastically. Like when you look at somebody and you're like, ah, lucky, you know? And it's like, man, I wish I was in your spot. And it's this, this word that you can look at somebody and say, listen, blessed are you. And essentially, this is Jesus' welcome. Because this is how you would greet somebody. Uh, when you all walked in, we have an amazing greeting team. I'm not sure if our greeting team, when we see people say, just simply say, hey, blessings. You know, like, it was, uh, that's the way we welcome people. It's not still the way we do it, but that's essentially what this meant. This word is the word blessings or happy or congratulations. And Jesus takes all the things that we think would make us happy, and he doesn't mention any of these that says, you're happy when. Uh, you know, we have our own idea of what it looks like to pursue happiness. That, you know, oh man, if I could only get that job. If I could only drive that car. If I could only marry that woman. If I could only not be married to that woman any longer. That would make me happy. Whatever it is in your life that you're looking at and thinking, this is the key to happiness. And if I only had this. Have you ever asked for something for Christmas or got something or bought something because you thought, this will make me happy. And then you never, ever used it. Like it sits in your closet. I remember for me, and just being personal, you know, just about who I am. I remember I thought, man, you know what I really need in my life is a functional lightsaber. Like the real kind, but they don't make those yet. So I'll settle for the models. The kind that make the sound and they light up and the zoom. And I have some of those and I love them. I built them myself because I thought that'll give me ownership of it. And I, I will have worked for that which makes me happy. And so now I have uh, one or two or three um, of these lightsabers that I've built with LED lights and, and tricked out. And, and realistically, they, they sit in my closet. And I spent a lot of effort on those. I spent a lot of time. And, and I, it caused my wife a great deal of confusion about my obsession about this. And, and it sits in my closet. And I thought it would make me happy, and I really, it still does. Um, but it is not something that I pull out. Have you ever found these things that you pursue to make you happy, and then you get there and you thought, huh, I wonder what's next? You see, our culture, our nation is built upon the pursuit of happiness. We, we write it down in our Declaration of Independence, and it's like, hey, uh, or, or is the bill, I don't know where it is. Somewhere in there, Hamilton said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like, these are the things that we're chasing. And so our, our nation, our country, our culture is built upon the pursuit of happiness. But you know what's written into those words? Is it's the very idea, it's something you pursue, not something you catch. You see, I want you to know this idea of chasing happiness, or what we call hedonism, uh, for, uh, for an old word, is this treadmill. It's like running on a treadmill after something, but you're never actually getting anywhere. You're just chasing it. And the happiness always seems to be right beyond you. You see, it's like a carrot in front of a horse that we just chase and chase and chase. And we're like, why can't I find happiness? And I, it just seems to be right on the other side. And I get it. And then I'm like, oh, well, that doesn't make me happy. There's a little further to go. And we run on this treadmill of the pursuit of happiness that our country is built upon. And I want to let you know, Scripture has a lot to say about true happiness. Uh, in fact, 56 times in Scripture... The word joy is, peer, is paired with the name of the Lord. Saying if you want to really find happiness, it comes from the Lord. If you really want to find happiness, it comes from holiness. 
In fact, we did a lot of work on this in our series back in Philippians when this first pandemic first started and we went online. We opened up to the book of Philippians and we said, let's talk about joy in the Lord despite your circumstances because we want you to be grounded in this. And so if you missed that, you can go back. It's all online. And we did a lot of work about, hey, there's a, there's a joining between happiness and the Lord. But unfortunately, when I say the key to happiness is holiness— it's almost like when my wife tells me, hey, the, the key to good health is exercise and only eating vegetables and steamed chicken. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like, it sounds like, hey, you know what will make you healthy? Cod liver oil. Doesn't that sound like, and you're like, oh. But that's how we look at it when someone says the key to happiness is holiness. And I'm like, is there, is there anything else? Because holiness doesn't sound appetizing. And yet that's the grounding, the basis of this. And Jesus is almost trying to flip this upside down on its head to say, listen, I'm going to talk to you about who's blessed. I'm going to talk to you about happiness. But immediately it's going to confuse you and not sound right into what we're going. So really quickly, we've read through the Beatitudes twice now. And, and as Jesus reads them, we want to think, Jesus, are you out of your mind? These people aren't happy. And so I really want to talk to you. I want to do a quick groundwork about what the Beatitudes are not. Because this is one of the most popular scriptures. It's one of the most well-read. And I think it's one of the most misread. And so I really want to lay a little bit of groundwork, if I can, for just about five minutes, about what the Beatitudes are not. Because I don't want us to get confused. The first thing is this. The Beatitudes are not a list of virtues. The Beatitudes are not a list of virtues, meaning they're not a list of things you should ascribe to be. It's not a list of good things. You see, sometimes we can take this idea that, oh, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, I should be poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Okay, I should be a mournful person. I should have despair. I should have depression in my life. And I'm like, I don't really think that's what Jesus is getting at. And as we just look at this, I don't think it's a list of virtues. The first thing he says is this. He goes, blessed are the poor in spirit. This word poor in Greek, there are a couple words for poor in Greek. One is the person who lives paycheck to paycheck, and they just can't seem to get ahead in life. That's kind of what we understand in America as poor. Then there's the person who lives hand to mouth. That's the kind of poverty we have no experience with in this country. Like, to truly understand that level of poverty... And he doesn't say, hey, you're just poor. He goes, you are spiritually poor, meaning you are a spiritual zero, as Dallas Willard will quote this. He goes, you have nothing to offer spiritually. He goes, religiously, you've got nothing. When I think about the poor, some of you know I was raised overseas. I was raised in Egypt. I was raised in Cairo. And it gives a different understanding and meaning to when you talk about the poor. There are people in Cairo who are called the Zebulim. And uh, here in America, we simply know them as the trash people. Because literally, they make their living off of trash. They are people who live in the dumps and will build their homes out of scraps. Wood, metal, whatever they can. And they will live and sustain themselves off of this. And they will send their young children, as young as eight years old, around with donkey carts around the city. And they will collect the trash for the city. Not because it's a social service, not because it's something the city offers. Simply because when people throw out their trash, they throw it into empty lots. And these children will come and dig through the empty lots and they will take it back to their people in hopes that they will be able to sustain something off of that. When I think about poverty, that's what I think of. And I do not think Jesus in this is saying poverty is a good thing. I don't think that Jesus looks at, even in our country, the, this gap between wealthy and poor and those who are truly in need and I don't think he thinks that's a good thing like I, I think about in places we've been when we go to Ecuador or when we go to Belize and I think about the people in true poverty and I don't think Jesus is saying that's a good thing you see these are not virtues and secondly it says blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted uh, I know that sometimes we spiritualize this one because ironically, all the rest have been spiritualized. We don't just say blessed are the poor. We say blessed are the poor in spirit because Jesus added that. We don't just say uh, blessed are, are the meek, or sorry, blessed are, are those who hunger and thirst. He says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So it's not just the hungry, it's not just the poor. But this one we like to spiritualize too. We say blessed are those who mourn and we think, oh, blessed are those who mourn over your sins, like who are truly sorry for what you've done. But Jesus doesn't spiritualize this one. 
He only says, blessed are those who mourn. Is anyone here sad today? Is anyone here wrestling with depression? Is anyone here grieving over a miscarriage? Over a wayward child? Over the death of a dream that ended up as a failure? Because you dreamt it up and you started everything up and right around the fall of 2019 and you thought, man, this is going to be great and it all crashed around you. And nothing turned out the way you thought it would. You see, mourning is not a good thing. Mourning, that kind of depression, that kind of sadness. Jesus says, blessed are you who mourn. And I'm like, really? Because I've been in a place of mourning before. And it's not a good thing. And I, these are not virtues. Then he says, blessed are the meek. When it comes to meekness, sometimes, how many of you guys have heard that meekness is strength under self-control? How many of you have heard that preaching before, that pastor Someone will say, oh, meekness is not this idea that you should be weak or anything. Meekness is where you are the strong one, but your strength is under control. And I've heard that message so many times, and I hate to be the one to tell you this. That is not what meek means, either in Greek or in English. Like, I wish that was what it meant, because self-control is a virtue. That we're like, yeah, we should all be self-controlled. That's just not what it means, though. In any language which, which we translate the Bible, you see, meekness simply means, blessed are the powerless. Blessed are the oppressed. Blessed are those living under injustice. He was speaking to the Israelite people who were under the oppression of the Roman Empire, who were living under the injustice of the empire. Peasant farmers who were no longer able to afford their homes because their taxes were so high, they had to sell their land and then work on the land that they used to own for a pittance of what they could have had because the taxes were so high that their property was seized. And he goes, blessed are you when you're meek, meaning you don't have an alternative. It's not those who are strong. It's those who could not get out because they were not strong enough. And he goes, blessed are the meek. It's not a good thing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, this actually sounds like we could turn this into a worship song. I'm pretty sure we have, you know. Like, God, I'm hungry for you and I'm thirsty for you. But see, when we think about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness... You hunger and thirst for stuff you do not have. You know why I actually, hunger is actually a pretty foreign sensation to me. Do you know why? One, because I make a habit of eating. Like, I don't get hungry. I eat three times a day at least. And then when I don't, I have plenty of extra storage uh, capacity in which I continue to run. And so really, hunger and thirst are a different concept for me. And when he talks about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he's referring to those who do not have it. You know why I don't hunger is because I have food. I'll be honest, I also don't hunger for righteousness. Like, because I have it. I am full of righteousness. Like, not my own. Okay, that sounded bad. Um, But it's this idea that, like, our righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. And because of my relationship with him, because of his death on the cross, because of his resurrection, I now am satisfied, which is what he says will happen, Like, with righteousness. I don't hunger for it because Jesus Christ and his death on the cross completely gave me all the righteousness I will ever need. And it's not of our own works. It's not what I'm going to say. I'm full of righteousness, but you know what I mean. I'm full of it because someone else prepared it for me. The same thing as what happens with food. So those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who don't have it. And it's not just righteousness means a right relationship with God, but righteousness also means a right relationship with people. And it's basically saying, hey, you don't have a right relationship with God or a right relationship with people. What Jesus is saying is, blessed are those whose lives are really, really messed up. You know what I think about when I think about this picture? And I hope this doesn't offend anybody. I think about parents who are, have lost their kids to CPS, who desperately want to get them back and can't because they're addicted to a substance or because they don't know how to get out of their lifestyle and their life is a mess, so much so that somebody had, else had to intervene for their children and pull them out. And they want to get their kids back, but their life is such a mess they can't put it back in order, even with help, even with systems, even with classes. And their relationship with their family is broken, their relationship with their God is broken, their relationship with everybody is just broken. And Jesus says, blessed are those who are really, really broken. So there are eight blessings in this 
uh, Beatitudes. They're broken into two groups of four. The second half actually begin to sound like virtues. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Like, merciful is a trait that we want to have. Because, like, we should be showing mercy upon other people. There are a lot of great teachings that we'll get into later in the Sermon on the Mount about forgiveness and the importance thereof and what happens if God shows forgiveness to you and you refuse to show that forgiveness to other people. So he says, hey, you need to show mercy. In fact, he even goes on to say, in the same level, you show forgiveness to other people. That's the way that forgiveness will be shown to you. Forgiveness is a critical part. And then he says, blessed are the pure at heart. And the pure at heart is not this idea that says, um, our heart is our emotions, like you have pure emotions. A lot of times in American culture, we think of the heart as the source of emotions. But in, in the Jewish and the Greek mindset both, the heart was more this picture of the core of who you are. He goes, meaning from the core of who you are, that's purity. You're, you're not your emotions, but your motivations are pure. Your ideas are pure. You have this, like, you genuinely want to do the right thing for the right reason. He goes, blessed are the pure at heart because they will see God. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers, which is something we all want to be. Except for when you realize that how the original audience of Jesus would have read this when he goes, blessed are the peacemakers. There were two groups of people politically aligned. There were the zealots who said, hey, let's like take out the Romans. Let's like stab them in a dark alley when they're not paying attention. Let's revolt and let's do the following things. And then you had the peacemakers who were the Benedict Arnolds who said, let's make peace with the empire and just live at peace with them. And suddenly that idea of peacemaker takes on a very different picture, doesn't it? He goes, but blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called children of God. Now that's a good thing if someone calls you children of God. Like for me, it's, I always love when people look at my kids and say, hey, you look just like your daddy. And I know they're making that up because my children fortunately all look like their mother. But like when they say that, what they really mean is you're funny like your daddy or you're charming like your daddy, whatever that is. And they're saying you inhibit, the, inhibit, you inhabit, you inherit, I don't know. You have the qualities of your father. We see it in you. And that's what it means to say, blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called children of God. They're looking and saying, hey, you have those same qualities as your father. I see it in you. Why? Because God is one who makes peace. Because we were at war with God and he made peace with us. All that to say that we cannot classify all of these beatitudes as a virtue. Secondly, we cannot say these, this is a list of commandments. It's not saying, hey, go and do the following things. Go and be spiritually poor. Go and mourn. Like, that's the command today. Everybody, thank you for coming. Go home and mourn, and then we'll be comforted. Uh, that's not what this is saying. It's not a list of commands. Uh, I, I've been at places and churches where they, we, they would have us pray through the Beatitudes and say, God, today would you just make me like this? Would you make me poor in spirit? And I thought, I don't want to pray that. Like, I got to be honest. And, and I thought, man, I mis maybe I misunderstand it. And I got to be honest. I still may be misunderstanding this. Of all of Jesus' teachings, which are flipped upside down, I feel like I have a good grasp on most of them. This is the most complicated one for me. The Beatitudes seem to elude me like no other teaching of Jesus. That I'm like, I, I feel like I'm trying to grab sand and it keeps on slipping through my fingers. But I don't think he wants us to pray to be poor in spirit. Why? Because I think Jesus wants you to be like rich in spirit. I think he wants you to have an abundance of the Holy Spirit. I think he wants you to know him so closely that you are like, just like this with Jesus. And I don't think, I think it's a silly thing to say, man, blessed are those who are persecuted. God, would you let me be persecuted today? Don't go pray that. Like, that's just a dumb thing to pray. It'll happen to you enough without asking for it. Instead, Jesus says, hey, like our Paul in the scripture says, hey, pray that you could live good, quiet lives so that you could spread the gospel without opposition. Why? Because it'll be better for you and it'll be better for the gospel. Now, that's not the way it's going to turn out. But you don't need to pray for resistance. You're going to find it if you're really living in the way of Jesus. These are not commands to go do. Hey, everybody today, go be hated and persecuted. We love you guys. Welcome to Fellowship of Oso Creek. That's not what he's saying as if these are a list of commandments. The third, this is not a list of timeless truths. These are a list of things that are coming true in the kingdom, but they are not a list of promises. It's not a list of timeless truths. The merciful will not always be shown mercy in this world. If you do not know that, I, I want you to know it. Um, the meek do not always inherit the earth. You know who's inheriting our earth? The politicians. Those who are reaching out and grabbing for it. If you don't see that in our society, you know, it's pretty obvious. It's not the meek, but it's those who are powerful who are inheriting the earth. 
So this is not a list of timeless truths and promises. And so all that saying, I, I don't want us to misunderstand this. So let's talk about what the Beatitudes are for a second. And the first thing we wrote under this is the Beatitudes are the gospel. You see, the Beatitudes are the gospel. That, that means simply the good news. And really, the entire gospel of Matthew is the gospel. It's the good news as a whole. But basically, the good news is this. Jesus is the king, and the king is coming. The kingdom of God is coming, and you are welcome in his kingdom. See, that's the good news. The kingdom of heaven is coming, and you can be part of the kingdom of heaven. You see, God is showing mercy upon us. He is reconciling the entirety of the world to himself, and you are welcome in it. And we got to remember, when we're opening up in the Sermon on the Mount, this is Jesus' welcome speech. As he looks around, he sees the crowd gather, as it says in verse 1 and 2, and this is how he greets them. Blessings on you, which is a greeting. Happy are you who are poor in spirit. Meaning you who are poor in spirit and don't have much to offer, you're welcome in my kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn. Hey guys, those of you who are incredibly sad right now, you're welcome in my kingdom. And come and find comfort that you cannot find in this world. You can find it in the kingdom of heaven. You can find it in Jesus. Blessed are the meek. Meaning those who cannot stand up for themselves. Because I promise you, if you follow me, I will take up your cause. You see, this idea of meekness means you have nothing to defend you. You have no one to step up for your cause except for God himself. See, living in a condition of meekness is living in a condition that you are completely dependent on God for justice, for everything you need in life. And he goes, here's the timeless truth. The meek, those who are truly dependent on me, they will inherit the earth. Not in this realm, but in my kingdom. And he goes, welcome to those of you who cannot stand up for yourselves. Welcome to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, meaning you do not have righteousness, but you would love for a right relationship with God, and you just can't seem to get your life together. And Jesus goes, welcome to you guys, because you guys are welcome in my kingdom. And he goes, these are the people in which I have come for. And those who are responding to the kingdom of God are not the rich, but it was the poor. Not the joyous, but those who are more. Not the strong, but the meek. It was not the religious elite. But it was the spiritual zeros who had no other hope. You see, Jesus says, hey, the church is not a place for the happy and healthy to just come and, and connect with God. Jesus will go on to say, listen, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. The church is designed to be a hospital for those who are hurting, for those who are far away from God, for those who had no place, for those who never felt like they could belong. And Jesus welcomes those who never belong anywhere. He goes, you guys can belong in my kingdom. And he goes, and it's an eternal kingdom. You see, this is the gospel. And if you want to know the gospel of Jesus, you can actually find it in the Beatitudes. It begins with we who are spiritually poor, who have nothing to offer. And he simply says this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes, those of you who have nothing to offer spiritually... He goes, you have nothing to offer, but the kingdom is offered to you. You see, I can offer this to you, and you can be welcome in me. He goes, blessed are those who mourn, meaning those who are sad. He goes, I can give you comfort, because this life is not fair, and it does not go the way you want. But there is another life coming in which you can find it, this, this hope that you sought. Blessed are the meek who can do nothing else. He goes, do you realize you can have an inheritance? You can inherit the entire world. You see... My children will have an inheritance from me. There are three lightsabers in my closet. And, and they'll figure out how to divide them evenly. Uh, I'm not sure how that will work. But their inheritance that they receive from me will not be based upon their strength. It will be based upon their relationship with me. I'm their father, they are my children. And see, in this world, we see a pattern of the strong of the privileged, of these various people grabbing for power and taking it from themselves as if they're going to inherit the earth. And what Jesus is saying is, he goes, this is going to be flipped upside down like a GameStop short sell. He goes, and the meek are suddenly going to inherit the earth. And it's this picture that says, listen, and when you inherit something, it's not based upon whether you were smart enough, because even that, that was based upon them being smart enough and collaborative enough and resourceful enough to seize for themselves. And all the people who benefited from that, the joy boxes are up front. Um, but those who inherit, 
It's not based upon whether you're able to snatch it or whether you were creative enough. It's based upon your relationship with your father. You see, there will be no point at which my children have to fight me for their inheritance, in which I will grab these lightsabers that are in my closet and say, duel me. And when you beat me, the day you beat me is the day you receive your inheritance. And we come together and I'm like, let's wrestle, child of mine. And when you beat me, then you can have your inheritance. When you outsmart me, then you can. That's not what it's based upon. You see, they don't have to do that because their inheritance is based upon my love. There's no hope that they have for receiving it except for my gracious nature. You see, that's how our inheritance is. We have no hope. We have no power. We have nothing else other than that of Jesus. And we receive from him because of our relationship with him. And you can be brought into the kingdom of God and find this. And it simply begins with this fourth one. You hunger and you thirst for righteousness. You say, God, I want a right relationship with you and I don't have it. God, could I be right with you and would you teach me how to be right with other people? And God goes, yes. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness because you will be filled with my righteousness. You will be filled with my Holy Spirit. I can pour it out upon you. You see, this is the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. Secondly, this is Jesus radically defining who is blessed. First of all, this is the gospel. This is the good news. It's an invitation to everybody, regardless of how down and out you feel, regardless of how unworthy you feel, regardless of how unworthy you feel someone else is, like they are welcome in the kingdom of heaven. They're welcome in the kingdom of God. And secondly, it's Jesus radically redefining who is blessed. I, I want to open up a book that we've never looked at before. It's called the book of Sirach, okay? It's a, it's a Jewish wisdom literature. Uh, some of you who are raised in the Catholic tradition, this is actually in the Catholic Bible. It's not in most of your Bibles. It's not in the NIV or things like that. It was left out simply because it just wasn't included. But it was a very popular teaching, rabbinical teaching in Jesus' day. And so Sirach chapter 25, we'll put it up on the screen for you because most of you don't have it in your Bibles. I just want to run through this real quick so that you can see what the traditional thinking about who was really blessed and who was really happy. This word um, that we've been talking about, the uh, uh, makarios. He goes, this is who the traditional people thought was makarios, who was blessed and who was happy. And so he goes ahead and he says this, I can think of nine people who I would call blessed, a tenth who my tongue will proclaim, a man who can rejoice in your children. So first of all, if you want to be blessed, you've got to be a man. Okay, I'm off at a good spot, half of you, sorry. Um, and he goes, who can rejoice in your children? Meaning, if you're a man and your children are actually well behaved and they give you joy, you're blessed. And all, all, all of a sudden, half of you men are also out of it because you're like, the darn kid, I will fight him for his inheritance. Okay, he goes, and a man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. Like, you are on top of the food chain, you are the number one guy at work, and everybody who has something against you, like, they're going to go down, and you're just going to rejoice over that. He goes, that's who's blessed. All right, it continues in verse 8. It says, uh, happy is the man who lives with a sensible wife, all right, so number one, you've got to have a sensible wife. How many of you men are like, raise your hands if you're like, yeah, I got one. Nobody. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right, so number one, uh, she, she's a sensible wife, so she's just like, you know, agrees with you on everything. Uh, happy is the man who does not plow with an ox and an ass together because you hate that, right? Like, um, I don't know what this means, actually. I think it's just this idea that, hey, you're wealthy enough that all your stuff matches, like, hey, we drive only blue cars. They look good together, whatever it is. Like, so I'm, I'm wealthy in this. But it's like, hey, I have an ox and I have an ass. They don't really go together. It doesn't look good. I don't know what this means. Maybe it was bad farming policy. Um, but you don't want it. And he goes, happy is the one who does not sin with a tongue. I haven't been blocked from Twitter or Facebook. They're all liking what I say. Like, I'm a well-spoken person. Happy is the one who does not serve an inferior. Like, when everybody else works for you, and, like, you work for your boss, and you're like, but he's an idiot. And it's like, happy are you when you are not, when you're the smartest man in the room. All right, continue. Uh, verse 8. And he goes, happy is the one who finds a friend. Actually, I like that one. Like, hey, friends are good. Join a life group. Um, and happy is the one who speaks to attentive listeners. Um, I, I'm, once again, half and half, okay? Depending on how pay much attention you're paying today. But like, hey, when people listen, like you're well-respected, you walk into a room, people want to hear what you have to say, and everybody's like, hey, that's a well-loved human being. Um, and he goes, how great is the one who finds wisdom? Oh, okay, so you got to be smart, and you got to be a wise person, but none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. And of course, we got to end it off with a religious note and bring Jesus into it somehow. 
this is the common teaching back in Jesus' day. And he's flipping it on its head. And he goes, oh, like, i, I got to be honest, I like the sound of this blessing. Like, I mean, except for the whole, uh, you know, ox and ass thing I don't get. But the rest of it, I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. And then Jesus flips it on its head. He goes, no, I'm here for the spiritual zeros. I'm here for those who cannot stand up for themselves. I'm here for those whose lives are so messed up. I'm here for those who love mercy and want to show it to other people. I, I am here for those who are pure at heart and have genuinely good motives. Uh, you see, your internal quality is not what's happening on the outside counts more. I am here for the peacemakers, those that simply want to be children of God. And I'm here for the persecuted, those who are going to stand up for God and stand up for the right way and will be scorned and hated because of it. And Jesus paints a very different picture of what a blessed life looks like. And he goes, you are all welcome in my kingdom, but I want you to know right now, it's going to look different than anything you ever thought. And Jesus flips on his head, on its head, he radically redefines who is blessed. I, I am so, I, I love the church. Not just Fellowship of Oso Creek, I love the church. I love churches, and I wish the best for like churches in general. And I don't want y'all to misunderstand this. There are a lot of churches who will preach a gospel that lines up more with the book of Sirach than the gospel of Matthew as far as what they're about, as far as what they're promoting. And they'll say health and wealth and good things to you and let's bring Jesus into it because then you're going to prosper. And I simply do not find that in the words of my Jesus. He reaches out to the poor. He reaches out to the have-nots. He shows mercy to those who don't deserve it. He asks us to be peacemakers, and he says, and if you truly follow this, it's going to lead you on difficult times of persecution. People are actually going to come at you with shots. I was talking just last week to a brother who said, man, I'm, I'm struggling because I poured out so much love and mercy to a good friend of mine, and he's just taking shots at me. And I got no response besides, blessed are you. <laughs> um, you're so lucky, man. You know, happy. And, and that's the, it's like, what? But then Jesus goes, hey, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say false things about you and say all kinds of evil things about you. He goes, but instead rejoice and be glad, glad. And it's like, hey, man, let's go out tonight. Let's have a beer and celebrate your reputation being drugged through the mud. It's like, what? He goes, no, 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 no. That's the way they treated the prophets. You see, it's not the blessing you want, um, but it's the blessing you deserve. Sorry, uh, that's Batman, not Jesus. <laughs> you see, if, if we grew up in the church like I did, you'd probably become numb to the Beatitudes and to their upside down ways. But it's this idea that, man, happiness in our culture is this idea of pursuing something that's going to make you happy, and it's going to be that treadmill that's never going to get there. It's going to be this idea that you keep on chasing it and it will not fulfill you. You see, happiness is based upon our good circumstances most of the time. This says, hey, if, if things are going well for you, and suddenly we're like, man, I'm happy and I'm blessed, and suddenly a year like 2020 comes in or a year like 2021 is about to be, comes in, and you're like, man, everything is going the wrong way. Like, like this just threw me for a loop and I don't know where to stand. And if your happiness is based upon those things, it's going to mess us up. Our happiness is based upon who is the president or whether it's a pandemic or how our dreams are doing. But then suddenly life happens and your marriage falls apart and your business crashes. And when everything you chase comes to a dead end, you're like, I can't be happy. And then Jesus shows up on the scene and he goes, blessed are you when you have nothing else to offer. Happy can you be? Why? Because you are welcome in my kingdom. And he goes, do you realize there's a bigger picture? You see, this is our welcome to the kingdom. It's our, it's our welcome to follow Jesus. Because Jesus comes along and he goes, who is poor? Who is sad? Welcome you. Congratulations and happy will you be. You are welcome in my kingdom. We wrote down in your creek notes, uh, Matthew chapter 11. If you flip about two pages over from where you are, you'll find Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Later on, Jesus will say this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, Yoke had two ideas at the time. Uh, Yoke was a giant wooden thing that you would put over an ox or an ox and an ass together if you weren't wealthy. Um, And they would walk together and they would pull your plow or your cart or whatever it is. The, uh, The yoke is the harness that you would attach to this beast of burden. Okay? And Jesus, it was also a euphemism for the teachings of a rabbi. A rabbi would come, his disciples would come to him, and he goes, hey, this is how to live if you want to be like me when you grow up, which is exactly what Jesus does through the Sermon on the Mount. He goes, if you want to be like me, I'm going to teach you all this stuff. And now he says, hey, you who are weary, you who are burdened, you who are poor, you who have nothing to offer, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, follow in my ways. He goes, because it seems difficult, but he goes, I want you to know, my yoke is light, and my burden is easy. He goes, because you won't bear the burden, I will. Because you know who carries the other half of this burden is Jesus Christ. He carried it on his shoulders as a cross, like a yoke upon his shoulders, like this burden that he would bear for us. He bore the burden of our sins, and we simply learned to walk alongside of him. You see, when Jesus came and he paid the price for us, we are welcome in his kingdom. And he goes, now, let me show you how to walk with me. And even after he raises from the grave, he goes, you receive my Holy Spirit, and I'm still walking with you, bearing the burden. And the Holy Spirit's what gives us the power to live this way. And he goes, you are all welcome, because anyone can learn to live in the way of Jesus, regardless of where you come from. Uh, I also put in there Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Um, I, I won't get into this one, but this is where Paul says, hey, I've learned the secret to being content in all circumstances. I know what it is to be poor, and I know what it is to have a, a surplus in my bank. I, I know what it is to be wealthy, and I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be abundance, and I know what it is to be in need. And then he says that well-known verse that we say, Philippians four thirteen: I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what he's referring to is regardless of my circumstances, I have found contentment if things are going well, if the business isn't red, if the business isn't black, if the stock market is doing well, if the stock market crashes, if my marriage is going well, if my marriage is failing, I have figured it out. I can do everything through Christ because he's carrying the other half of his yoke. He's bearing my burden. He bore the cross and I simply have to walk alongside of him and relearn how to do this life in his way. And that's what we'll be doing in the book of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, is we'll be learning this is the way to walk in Jesus. And today is simply a day to say wherever you're coming from, you are welcome in his way. And the last note we put in your creek notes, second to last note we put in your creek notes is this. The only way to make sense of Jesus' list of blessings is through the kingdom of God. The only way to make sense of Jesus' blessings is through the kingdom of God. Because these things will not apply in normal life only if you're a citizen of the kingdom. Because the things that are wrong with the world will one day be set right. And we who mourn will be comforted in the spirit and will be comforted in heaven. But it's not just this idea, I know, Matt, everything will be set right in heaven and like all the persecution and everything will be right again when we all die. But like we talked about last week, the kingdom of heaven is coming here. And it's beginning to change on this plane. It's beginning to change in this world. And it's beginning to change through the actions of you, the church. It's beginning to change through things like blankets and backpacks. It's beginning to change through things like you'll find out about next week about chickens and love in Ecuador. That's going to be a lot of fun. Come next week. Um, I don't want to give that too much away. It's beginning to change through the actions and the love and what's happening of the church. And suddenly, those who don't deserve mercy are being shown mercy. Those who are spiritually poor are being welcomed into the kingdom. Those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for a right relationship with God and other people, are being retrained in how to live in it in this world. And Jesus says, this is all happening, and it's coming here now, not just in the future. And we are administrators of this, but it only makes sense in light of our new citizenship in the kingdom. And suddenly, this is the way. And finally, the kingdom of heaven is both the present reality and a future hope. That's just a reminder of the entire message we talked about last week. 
the kingdom of heaven is a present reality and a future hope. I love that Jesus kind of gives us away a little bit in the Sermon on the Mount because in the first and the last beatitude, he goes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is, circle, highlighter, underline, is the kingdom of heaven. And everything else, he goes, they will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. They uh, will be filled. And it's talking about what's happening in the future. And then, of course, he brings it all back around and he goes, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is now and it will be fulfilled in the eternal, but it's even beginning to come into our present time. And in the world as it is right now, this list is not true. But in the future, we know it to be true. And even now, we're seeing it come into reality. And so today, I simply want to end by offering you a place, by offering you a welcome, by offering you a blessing and greeting you blessings upon you to say that if you are down and out, if you don't feel worthy, if things are not going your way, if 2021 is going to look like another 2020, if everything is happening and this is not going your way, let me teach you a new way. Let me talk to you about the way of Jesus. Let us welcome you into his kingdom because Jesus prepared the way for you. And we want to let you know that this kingdom is open to you. This is an invitation to you to simply say, I want to step into this promise. I want this kingdom because I cannot find my own righteousness and I cannot find my own spirituality, but Jesus has come and learned from me. My burden is light. And regardless of your circumstances, I can teach you how to walk with me. And that's the invitation to each and every one of us today to follow. For those that are followers of Jesus, for those that have decided to walk in his way, I, I want to let you know, we're going to come to some difficult teachings. That isn't difficult to grasp or understand like this one was. We're going to come to some difficult teachings where God's going to ask you to give up some things. Where he's going to ask you to surrender some things to him. And it'll be this, the kingdom expanding in your heart kind of stuff. And what it means to walk in his ways. And you'll have to make some difficult choices. And I want to let you know, welcome him in. This is what it means to walk in his way. To take up his yoke. To bear some of this responsibility and say, God, I surrender this area of my life to you. And today, as we continue in worship, I just want to invite you to surrender areas of your life to Jesus. Whatever area was not surrendered this morning, surrender it now. Whatever things you were holding back from him this morning, give it to him now. Take his burden upon you and say, God, train me in your way. And hear his voice say, welcome, my child. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for today. I thank you so much for uh, just the privilege of being with you. God, my prayer is this. Would you make us more like you? God, for those of us who are struggling with our worth in your kingdom, would you remind us it's never been about our worth. It's never been about what we have to offer. Because things can look great on the outside and we can just be a wreck on the inside. And you say, that's okay. I'll take you on too. And would you begin to transform us and change us? Make us more like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we continue in worship?